as uh, Chris said, I've, I've been doing Bluebird talks for, I guess, closer to 25 years now. <coughs> and um, we're going to talk about the Eastern Bluebird. As you probably know, there are three species of bluebirds, the western, the mountain, and the eastern. Uh, the western bluebird occupies parts of California down into Mexico, and the mountain bluebird uh, begins in, within the Rocky Mountains and extends a little west. And of course, the eastern bluebird uh, is present in the entire eastern part of the country from the Rocky Mountains east to Maine to Florida. So we're going to talk about the eastern bluebird. Uh, a few years ago I did a program out in Garner to a senior group. And I got there early and, and uh, there was a member of the group already there seated in a front row chair with the arms crossed waiting for my lecture. I had a little time to chat with her. Uh, I'd already been told that she was 100 years old. So I chatted with her and uh, in passing I said, I'll bet you've seen a lot of bluebirds in your day. She says, oh yes I have. I grew up on the Outer Banks. Uh, uh, Actually, uh, uh, Oak Oak uh, Oak Island, and I used to go to the mainland. We used to go to the mainland and get them. Well, that sort of went over my head, and I proceeded with my talk. When I finished, I asked questions, and her hand immediately went up. She says, "I don't have a question. I have an explanation, so you won't think I'm crazy." I thought you were going to talk about blueberries. <laughs> so, no, no offense, but listen up. Bluebirds today. Actually, there's a correlation between blueberries and bluebirds. The famous uh, late Jack Finch was a blueberry farmer, horticulturist, but his, his uh, mainstay was. Uh, Blue, blueberries. And from, I remember many, many years ago on the way to Moorhead City, we could stop in Nash County and get blueberries. Well, uh, Jack became my mentor when I got excited about uh, bluebirds. And I'll, I'll tell you, it, you'll be interested to know how I got struck by the conservation of the almost disappearing bluebird. During my master gardener training at the Wake County Office Park, it was fairly new then, Herb Evans, the county agent and director of the master gardener program at that time, found a bluebird box in the basement of the Commons building up there. And knowing of my interest in, in birds, he asked me if I knew how to put up a bluebird box. I said, yeah, I'm an expert. And jokingly, I had heard Jack Fitch lecture one time. So I figured I was an expert. <laughs> so I fashioned a pole similar to this and directed the box near the pond in the back of the commons building. Uh, I hadn't seen a bluebird in 40 years. I came to, to Raleigh in 1939 from the foothills of North Carolina, where bluebirds were not plentiful back in the mid-30s, but they were present. I remember seeing them on my grandfather's farm in McDowell County. They found hole, knot holes and holes in fencing, uh, rail fencing usually, or the only 
fences you saw back then. And I remember seeing the two words when I was a kid. Came to Raleigh, and after 40 years, I had not seen a bluebird. I knew they were in trouble, but I didn't know much about, about why and what to do about it. So I put the box up in, in early spring, a little bit earlier than this, and put it in place and walked back to the rock wall around the little garden in, in behind the commons building and looked back to see if it looked straight and in place. You know the bottom line. I saw a pair of bluebirds sitting on the box. A pair. And I was so excited, I uh, finished the box. And uh, as a matter of fact, they continued to build a nest and, and raise the family. The first, uh, first nesting that uh, I'd ever seen in a box. So that's how I got hooked on bluebirds. I proceeded to put more boxes around the office park. And adjacent to the office park, as you know, is the historic uh, Oakview Park, a natural habitat for bluebirds. Open spaces, lots of trees, uh, pecan trees, lots of spaces, and I expanded there uh, as many as 15 or so boxes, and it became one of my model bluebird trails. And of course, there was <coughs> the need for an expansion of the project. I've, I also established trails at some of the golf courses. Wilmar Golf Course in East Raleigh was one of my first uh, uh, bluebird trails. And Crabtree Park and Brentwood Park, many greenways and uh, schools. Martin Middle School, where I've done bluebird programs for the science department for many years. So that's how I got it hooked on bluebirds. And many people have been, been uh, responsible for the return of the bluebird. Uh, people like Jack Finch, one of our own North Carolinians, uh, took up the cause in the early 70s when it was apparent that the bluebirds were almost disappearing. He fashioned a box 40 years ago or more. Uh, this box right here, we call it the Bailey box because it's made in Bailey, North Carolina, where Jack Pitts had his uh, farm. And uh, he's deceased now as of four or five years ago. But his son carries on and makes, still makes the box. And it's probably the best box on the market if you want to buy a box. And uh, it's, it's great because it's got a metal top and it'll last a long time. Uh, he even learned how to, to grow a special wood that's light and easy to work with to make his box. And he grows the trees and uh, harvests the lumber, polonia tree, princess tree, princess? which uh, for well-known reasons uh, was used by, in the Orient uh, shipping wooden trinkets to, to this country. It's a light and durable wood. There are other, other people that we, we I can't name all of them, but there's been so many. Mr. Zeleni in Maryland established the North American Bluebird Society, which uh, of course took up the cause and, and still is a very viable uh, institution for conservation of bluebirds and other birds. And 
Cornell University also has been a pioneer in research and uh, development of, of uh, methods to preserve their, their population. Uh, Jack Finch made the box and traveled up and down the eastern seaboard telling people the problem and how to, how to help out the cause by building boxes and, and uh, <coughs> establishing boxes. Uh, if, you, if you don't remember anything I say, remember this, that without man-made boxes, we would have no bluebirds. So we, we want to be sure that we don't become complacent or forget to put up boxes for years to come. And, uh, as you know, they're cavity nesters and their original habitat was not holes. Uh, they're actually secondary cavity nesters, meaning that they can't make a hole themselves they depend on old woodpecker holes, knot holes, and so forth in order to build their nests. So when this country, this country began to industrialize and build, uh, destroy thousands of acres of trees for farms and buildings and cities and parking lots and highways, Pretty soon their habitat was destroyed and they, they had nowhere to go. There were other reasons that entered into the equation also. The uh, introduction of pesticides, of course, not only bluebirds but all birds uh, suffered from that. <coughs> uh, tobacco barns in eastern North Carolina. I've talked to many uh, farmers, tobacco farmers over the years, and they tell me that when they, when they harvest tobacco and fire up their barns with a wood stove, wood to cure the tobacco, they would open the stove and find dead bluebirds in, in the stove. Of course, they were attracted to the flu. Uh, flu cured tobacco, so they were, so Jack Finch found out about that and uh, encouraged farmers to put screens over their flues, so he did a great thing right there to save thousands of bluebirds. And uh, I mentioned pesticides, and also, the introduction of non-native birds to this country did, took its toll on bluebirds. The English sparrow came along. You might be surprised to know how the English sparrow got to this country. The U.S. Department of Agriculture imported English sparrows to combat a problem with uh, some sort of insect uh, destroying apple trees. Well, I, I never have found out if it worked, but you know the rest of the story. We've got millions of these sparrows. If you've never seen one go to the farmer's market, you see them everywhere at the farmer's market. So they're cavity nesters, and they're, they're also extremely aggressive. They compete vigorously for the nest box. They actually can go in and Destroy the bluebird nest, pick the eggs, and drop them outside. And they can also kill the bluebirds. And uh, they fill up their the net, the box with their typical nest. They're easy to recognize. They use uh, feathers, straw, uh, sticks cigarette butts, cellophane, anything they can find. And they fill up the entire box with that junk with a canopy over the nest. And uh, so they entered into the equation of the, the destruction of the birds. 
Also, the starling is a cavity nesting bird. You may not know that. The, star, the, uh, the European starling is a cavity nester. And they competed for the boxes. Uh, do, you, do you happen to know how the starling came to this country? A never been, uh, living in New York City read about Starling in some of Shakespeare's work. He also remembered them from the old country. So this nostalgia encouraged him to find some way to get Starlings to this country. He had a friend in the old country ship him a pair of Starlings and they, they uh, arrived safely and uh, eager to reproduce they made it, and they made it, and they made it. And guess what he did with them? He had so many, he didn't know what to do with them. He took them to Central Park and turned them loose. So when you say thousands of starlings go over, you know where they came from. Yeah. Pardon? Uh, a man lived in New York City, an uh, immigrant, uh, not too long ago old country. And uh, so the starlet though has been that that problem was easily corrected. The size of the hole in a bluer box is one inch and a half or, or close to that dimension. That excludes the starlet. They're big birds and they can't get in the box. So that problem was easily taken care of. So, many of you, or all of you probably know about the Migratory Bird Act enacted in the late 1800s that uh, prevents us from owning any portion, part of a songbird, feathers, eggs, even the nest. Uh, it's unlawful to possess those, and a lot of people don't know it. I knew it early on in my bluebird uh, work. I paid no attention to it until I became a director of the North Carolina Bluebird Society, and I had a great collection of nests. It's a great way to learn the type of bird. They all use different materials. Well, they, the, the uh, officials frowned at my my work and I had to get rid of the nest. You can get a permit, it costs you about $100 or more a year and you have to make quarterly report, extensive reports, what you're doing, why, so. And even if you have a permit, children can't understand why you can have the nest and they can't. So it's, it's not a wide practice anymore to display nests. The bluebird, uses almost exclusively pine straw for their, for their nest. Occasionally dried grass, but always pine straw. So knowing the uh, material used by various songbirds, you, you know what's in your box, whether you see them or not. There, there are other songbirds that compete vigorously with the bluebirds also, chickadees, tit mice, House wrens, occasionally Carolina wrens, not often. And um, there's nothing we can do about that. The Carolina wren is, is a beautiful bird, friendly, and everybody knows the Carolina uh, bird <coughs> by the stripe on their head, the perky tail. You see them everywhere in your flower pots ports and deck in and out bushes looking for insects and they're a pretty little bird they sit and they're almost never still they're always jumping all of you have seen that that's the good one that's the Carolina red I think your speaker went off he's yeah. I think Chris has maybe gone to get a new battery or something he just left yeah the lights are okay pretty, pretty I think he'll be back 
Chris maybe went to get a battery or something. He just left. Yeah, I'll speak louder. I'll speak louder then while we get to that problem. Killed the battery. <laughs> Sorry, Bill. Sometimes you check it, it shows that it's full and it's just lying to you. <laughs> I have a question while we're looking. Okay. So you, you're you not allowed by law to remove the nest from any uh, place you find them? Technically, no, but of course, uh, in order to ensure the survival, we do that in the monitoring process. We move, remove the old nest because they never use the same nest again. And if you leave the old nest in, then you've got a new nest on top of an old nest that's full of uh, poop and, uh, <laughs> ants and roaches and almost anything else you can think of. So we, in monitoring the box, we we encourage move, removing the old nest after ever nesting because the birds don't go back, the babies don't go back in the box, even the parents don't go back in the box except when she uh, after uh, teaching her babies how to find their own food she'll come nest again sometimes three times in the, in the season nearly always twice sometimes three times in the same box so we uh, we, we encourage monitoring in the box and uh, do that and to clean it out easily, we encourage the use of nest cups. All of you know about the nest cup. Uh, in a typical uh, box, if the bluebird builds a nest, it comes almost up to the the hole, and you can't see in the nest, can you? You don't know what's in it. You may have bluebird eggs, you may have uh, cowbird eggs. You know about the cowbird, they don't make a nest, they drop their eggs in other nests, often in the bluebird nest. It's a speckled, different, larger egg than the bluebird egg. So we encourage monitoring. And Jack Finch, I think, invented the, the, uh, the, the uh, nest cup. The nest cup is uh, for our use. The bluebirds don't care whether the nest cup is in the box or not. They'll build a nest either way. But it makes it easy to monitor. Uh, you can take it out and look at the uh, contents. And unlike the old wives' tale that, that babies, if you touch the babies of the nest, the birds will go away. Everybody's heard that. And it's it's still hard to suppress that, that thought that uh, they will go away. It is, a, it is a myth. You can touch the eggs. You can touch the babies. You can touch the nest. You can take the nest out and look at it. And we do that in order to uh, record the contents, we need to know when the nest is built. They, they uh, build their nest somewhere starting in the middle of March. And uh, the male usually finds the boxes all winter. You see bluebirds going in and out the boxes. And I get a lot of calls, think, people thinking they're nesting already. They're just checking out the boxes. They don't, they don't uh, nest them. So with the nest cup, then you can uh, uh, know when the nest is built. You know when it's finished. When it's finished, in one or two days, she's going to lay the first egg. So you put that on your calendar. And when she lays five eggs, which is the usual number, sometimes four, sometimes six, usually five. 
then you know within one or two days it's going to start incubating. So you put that on your calendar, and then you know that in 12 to 14 days the birds are going to hatch, babies are going to hatch, and you've got then got babies. And the monitoring, you know, if all sometimes all the eggs don't hatch, and uh, so you write that on your calendar how many hatch, and we, we need to know how many hatch, and then follow up monitoring process, we know how many survive and how many fledge. Those are the steps we need to record. So, can that cup be plastic or does it have it, to be? Well, the original ones were, were heavy peat like this made especially for, for this purpose. Jack Pitch made one a little bit different from this, but still heavy peat. And these are still available. They're a couple of bucks for a few boxes. That's not much to pay. But when you got a hundred or more, like I've <laughs> monitored over the years, we've learned that other other uh, some you have to go to a bird store. Sometimes Logan's, uh, the other hardware stores have them. But we know that other things work now. The uh, Peat moss that you start flowering in costs 20 cents. And it works just as well as the other. It doesn't last as long, but it works just as well. That's, that's a 20 cent cut. We, we even know that blueberry uh, boxes work. All you need is a method to just get the nest out. And if you the bigger the box, the bigger the nest is going to be. So this is actually a good, good product. You've got plenty of them. Pardon? Can you reuse them? Yes, as long as they're still intact in good shape. And uh, there's a new one I saw recently that actually works. Looks like a nest. And even, even flower pots, square or round, provided they fit snugly in the box. You don't want a small, too small because the baby can fall out and become trapped outside. It's plain flower box. So in, uh, by knowing the age of the babies, you've got that on your calendar, in 12 to 14 days they're going to hatch. And when the babies are 10 days old, or about 10 days old, we, we stop monitoring the box because the babies are active, they have feathers, and they're beginning to develop their wings and flying power. And if you open the box, they'll, they'll fledge prematurely. We know that. I've, I've even seen it happen. Uh, and you you can catch them, put them back, but they come out fast as you put them back. So that, they're, they're, they're really lost when when that happens. So when they're ten days old, we don't look at the box anymore because of that event. Uh, usually, when we monitor, uh, sometimes she'll be sitting on the eggs. So we we knock on the box. Anybody home? Usually she'll fly out. Uh, if not, uh, you can open the box then and see if she remains on the nest. You gently close it and check it another time when she's not in the box. If you frighten her and alarm her too much, she'll scramble and sometimes break the egg getting out of the box. So you don't do that. The male is usually sitting in the tree power line watching them. And they will die by me when you monitor the box early on. They become accustomed to seeing you do this and they'll sit in the tree and watch you. They often die by me. You can hear the beaks clicking when they go over your head but they never touch you. And uh, uh, the, the uh, famous writer, local writer A.C. Snow learned how to 
get bluebirds to eat out of his hand by giving them mealworms, favorite uh, food for bluebirds and other birds. He had them eating out of his hand. So they're going to fledge then in 18 days. Uh, if you're lucky, you can see that happen. It happens early in the morning, usually. Uh, and most of them leave the same day, hardly ever do they. You, you get one who thinks he's a chicken, <coughs> plays chicken and spray to jump out. But they all fledge usually within hours of each other. And uh, I'd like to mention this, this came up with uh, an email question recently. Um, how do you have, what happens in cold freezing weather? Well, we know that that sometimes destroys the embryo and we uh, can't do too much about it. Some people will cover the box with, with uh, some kind of wrap to ensure survival from freezing. But if, she, if, if the mother bird kept eggs warm, she would initiate early, early uh, development of the process. I've gone through this with my friend Bob Sexton. He wanted to know about that. And, uh, it's unfortunate they can't sit on the eggs and, and protect them. Oh, well, that does take its toll every year from uh, their survival. And uh, if, if she started, if the incubation was different in the babies, they would be different size and age, so they all were the same size and fledged at the same time. I think now would be a good time to start our, our video. <coughs> After the video, we'll talk about boxes and other questions that you might have. This might be a good time for one question, Bill, just because it'll take a moment or two for the right. director to warm up. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the question if you have it. How far apart should you place boxes? In the early, early days, and even some of the literature and internet information you get now tells you some abstract number, 100 yards apart. <clears throat> I've proved over the years you can have much closer than that. Uh, it, especially if you've got a visual barrier. I've got boxes at one golf course, three boxes within 30, probably 30 yards of each other. And they're all active and producing bluebirds. There's a visual barrier. If you got one close by, you won't have two bluebird families that close together. They won't tolerate their own species. But we do know now that you can have two boxes in your yard close together. Chickadees and wrens and the other cavity nesters often beat the bluebirds to the box. If they do that, you've got an extra box for the bluebird. Just by having two boxes. And they will tolerate another species of birds close by, and often do. But they won't tolerate their own species. So we have two boxes in the yard, three if you want to. So. Uh, the video's ready to go, Bill. All right. The man who produced this video, used the camcorder, that's what they were called back in the old days. Kind of easy. He, he put a camcorder, as they were called in the old days, Top of the box, and and the photographs the entire the process that you'll see coming up here. This rare footage was taken from our 1999 Need a little more It's fun, educational, and a must-see for 
all Bluebird enthusiasts. Now, let's go inside the nest box. Here's the nest cam filming location showing you how bluebirds have adapted to urban sprawl. The bluebirds in for a quick feed and off again. Now, have you ever wondered what goes on inside of a nest box? You're in for a real treat. Here's the star. You would think you would build from the floor up, but look at this. Here's mom building the nest. The flutter in action is used to actually form the cup. This process takes anywhere from two days to a week. Now, notice how the cup is formed towards the back of the nest. Once again, there's mom using the flutter in action to form the cup. Now the finishing touch with the fine grasses lining the cup. There's the completed nest. Egg lay. Here's mom labor to lay the first egg. See how hard she's breathing? Ah, immediate relief. <laughs> Look how excited she is. Look, everybody. Look what I did. <laughs> There's our first egg. Now two eggs. And three eggs. There's four eggs. And now all five eggs. Incubation. Mom appears to be turning the eggs with her feet. <coughs> Dad brings her some food and she settles back down. Once again, she's turning the eggs. The second baby has just hatched. And mom carries the eggshell out. Let's try that eggshell. This time, hey, she gets it down. Mom senses there's something getting ready to happen.
watch, you can see the egg actually crack open. Dad brings food. The baby's hatched out. Mom's an eggshell pro now. <clears throat> we call it Bluebird Fossilax. The other eggshell half. Now watch the top right egg. We've time-lapsed this so you can see the entire process. This is something that we rarely see in egg hatching without mom around for a clear view. The beak just cracked the egg open. Now it's starting to open up. Hello, world. Look, Mom, my eggshell helmet. Day five. The nestling's eyes are still closed. Mom's bringing full-size grasshoppers. Mom usually carries out the fickle sacks, but sometimes she eats them. The fickle sack is rich in calcium and down. protein. So she sometimes eats that. <coughs> the nestling that has just been fed is usually the one that produces the fecal sac. Dad brings in a crooked. Mom feeds. Hungry nestlings. Mom brings in another grasshopper, and who's hungry? You've always wondered how these birds grow so fast. Watch this. That's a grub that's larger than thumb. <laughs> Now that's what you call a mouthful. <laughs> Help, Dad! <coughs> you 
You got better help out. <laughs> Can you breathe? <laughs> Are you okay? Are you sure you're okay? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> Are you really sure? <laughs> okay, kid. Day eight. The eyes are now open and they're growing. Feeding gets more aggressive. Notice how clean the box is even after eight days. Bluebirds are very clean nest keepers. Day 10. <laughs> Nestlings are really growing. Competition for food and feeding are now fast. <laughs> Watch how fast this feeding is. Hungry mouse. Day 14. Almost full grown, nestlings are starting to get their speckled look with most of their feathers. Feedings are now even faster and more hungry mouse. Day. 18 days old and time to leave the box. Five nestlings. Now four. Now three. Mom and dad are calling and encouraging with food from outside the box. I think I can. I think I can. I know I can. There he goes. Hey, where did he go? Looks like fun. Now two. Now only one left. And finally, an empty nest. Job well done. Now for the question we get asked the most. How do I put up a nest box? Let's show you just how easy it is. Here's a nest box, a two-piece pole system, and a hammer. This is all you need to get started. We're at an edge area about 10 feet from the woods. The ideal orientation is somewhere east and north, away from the prevailing winds which blow from the southwest in North Carolina. Hammer in the first pole. Now, just slide the second pole over the first pole. Now, let's put up the nest box. On the back of the box, just bend over the strap. And slide the strap into the slot. <coughs> and there you have it. The bluebird box is just that easy. As you can see, bluebirding can be fun for the entire family. <laughs> Until next time, happy bluebirding. Those boys are in college now. <laughs> Uh, about the orientation of the box. <coughs> We, we know that we, we need to put the boxes in open spaces away from dense bushes. The uh, sparrows and uh, the uh, wrens 
the house wrens and other smaller birds love the dense bushes. They can hide and jump in the box almost without even seeing them. So that's one reason we like to put them out in the open. And uh, I, I believe I forgot to mention about the house wren, the first cousin to the Carolina wren. They are very aggressive and, and uh, unkind to the bluebirds. They, every spring, I see a dead male bluebird or two in the boxes. The little tiny uh, house sparrow, they look just like the, the uh, Carolina, I mean the wren I'm talking about, the house wren. Uh, they look very much like their cousin, the Carolina wren, except that they don't have the stripes, they don't have the perky tail, and they're not friendly. You don't see them, hardly ever see them. They're dashing in and out of the bushes and into the box. And every spring I see one or two or three dead male bluebirds in the box where the bluebird nest has begun and we see sticks. The house wren uses sticks with their nest, plain sticks. Sometimes they fill up the whole box. As many as 750 sticks. I, I, I counted them one time. <laughs> and uh, they fight the male bluebird. They're not much bigger than your thumb. They fight the male bluebird. They peck, peck his eyes out and renders them helpless and they die. We see that every year. That's the house house wren. They're protected songbirds, and we can't do anything about that. We're not supposed to even tear the nest out. I can't tell you to tear the nest out. <laughs> Get somebody else to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but that that's an eternal problem with with. Uh, Bluebird nesting is a house wren. They're so, so uh, dangerous and uh, aggressive. We've mentioned the Bailey box. There are other, other boxes on the market now. Uh, the most famous one now probably is a credit union box. You may know about it. <laughs> it, is a, it is a great box. And it's made by a man who discovered the grief and the disappearance of the bluebird many years ago when he came back from the service. And he set out to do what Jack Finch had been doing a long time, to make many boxes and get them out into the public. So he makes this box. His name is Frank Newell. He lives in Warrington, North Carolina. And he makes this box. He has volunteers. He has a big warehouse. I think he builds his own lumber, I'm not certain. And he has volunteers coming from everywhere on Birdhouse Day, far away as Richmond, Virginia. And they put these boxes together. He has them cut out already. And they make a box every 30 minutes. Yeah, every 30 seconds, I meant to say. <laughs> and uh, there are thousands of them in the countryside now. It is a great box, heavy lumber, and the dimensions are, are good. They're good boxes and they're bad boxes. Uh, the uh, square inches should be at least 16, four by four. If it's any smaller than that, you can't get a cup in it. Even if you could, sometimes I'll show you a, a bad box. The birds can't can't uh, develop in a small box. And the bluebirds' parents don't know that. Uh, this box is heavy, as I mentioned, and it has flanges on it. One of the biggest problems in putting up a bird in the house is knowing how to how to mount it. You can buy poles at the bird stores. If you've got thirty, forty dollars, and it's a, it's a great pole. That the Jack Finch devised the two pole system. He drives one pole in the ground, 
and puts the other pole down over it. And uh, his boxes have a hook on the back that hooks into the top of the pipe. One problem with this box, uh, I don't like to criticize anything that Frank Newell does. He's, he's a wildlife rehabilitator, poet, writer, and a great guy, and he's done more than anybody we know in the current uh, process of uh, saving the bluebirds. There's one little problem with this box. Despite the thickness and heavy duty material, it rots very quickly. In about two, about three, four years, this is what the top looks like. So it needs to be waterproof, painted. Other than that, it is a great box, and he's done so much for the survival of the species. Uh, I make a, a simple box. I call it my generic box. It's simple, has all the dimensions of um, the distance from the hole to the floor should be at least six inches. Some predators can reach through the hole like uh, possums occasionally, but not often. Raccoons often, with their dexterous limbs can reach in and pull the contents out. When you see the nest pulled out and on top, you know a raccoon has been in the box. Uh, there's not too much you can do about that. You can place a, make, make the hole deeper by putting a plaque on it like this. And it makes it harder for them to reach in. This box is made from treated wood. People, some people still don't know that treated wood does not have the arsenic content that it used to have. One time it was dangerous to humans and animals and birds, but the arsenic has been removed as of probably seven, eight years ago. And uh, this box has all of the dimensions size, has an opening, it's easily accessible, it has lots of ventilation here, here, and uh, the bottom, the corners are cut out of the bottom, they, some people call them drainage holes, if you've got water in your box you got a problem, you, it's not the drainage hole that, that saves it. So. So it needs good ventilation. And in the video, this gentleman mentioned orientation, direction of the box. Uh, he, he mentioned facing it away from the prevailing southwesterly North Carolina winds. I have, I have a strong issue about that. The birds never go back in the box except in icy, snowy, uh, severe weather, such as ice storms. Sometimes they go in boxing groups, five or six, and sit on each other's shoulders to keep warm. Otherwise, they never go back in the box. So the southwesterly wind doesn't make any difference in the wintertime. If it's in the summertime, if I were a bluebird, I would welcome southwesterly <laughs> winds blowing so that, that doesn't make any difference in the, in the nesting season. Should it, um, be, should it be facing a tree or, uh, or no? Well, some of the literature tells you you've got to face it toward a bush. Well, that's, that's uh, ideal, but I'll tell you, when the birds come out, they, they do like to go to parts of the yard, bushes, and heavy plants in order to hide, because that's when they're most vulnerable, when they're fledging and running around on the ground. Cats, even other birds, blue jays, and some of the other birds catch them and, and uh, eat them. So 
it's good to have bushes around, but I'll tell you, I've seen babies come out of this box and fly across a pond, uh, maybe a hundred yards across a pond in order to get to some woods. So I don't think they have any trouble with, with their, with that aspect of their pledging. I've seen them come out and fly over my house to the back of it. So they're, they're not going to have any problem. Yes? Why not put them on trees? Uh, bluebirds really would like them on trees. Okay. That's one reason Mr. Newell puts his flange on his box. I cut it off when I use them because I don't put them on trees. And, and I ask him the question. We don't like to put them on trees. It encourages all the predators that you can think of. Snakes, raccoons, flying squirrels. If you've got a lot of trees around, flying squirrels are going to build a nest. I've seen them. many of them, flying squirrel nests. So uh, on a tree, it, roaches, ants, snakes can more easily get in the in the box and on a pole. They, they can climb the poles okay. But, so for that reason, we don't like to put them on trees. Also, who likes to put nails in your trees in your yard? That's not a good idea. So uh, I also Waterproof. This, this box that I make is made from treated wood. Now you can't just buy any piece of treated wood, size and shape that you need. Decking is heavy and not easy to work with. And you know, cedar is beautiful. It lasts a long time. Western cedar. It's more expensive. You know what I use? Dog-eared fencing. Is there anyone who does not know what dog-eared fencing is? It's a board like this that you make fences out of. <laughs> That's the dog ear. So th this board comes in a 10-foot section. It's cheap, costs about $2.45. It's treated wood. And it's sometimes not milled accurately. It has knot holes in it, but but uh, I think knot holes are pretty. <laughs> I don't have a box with knot holes in it. So treated wood, and even treated wood, I finish with a waterproofing like this. How high? What height? What height? Depends on how tall you are. <laughs> uh, if you're um, this short, that, that's a good height. In other words, so you can see in the box. You can reach it and monitor it. If, another reason, people, you see people put tree, on trees 10, 12 feet up, it becomes a neglected box because you can't monitor it, you can't look in it, can't it's clean it out. So that's the other reason to put it at eye level. And uh, I can tell you which direction to put it in also in the yard. Turn it so you can see. You can watch the activity <laughs> from your kitchen and wherever you see the box. And you can put them out in a field and the birds will sometimes build in the box with no trees around, it's not a good idea. The boxes get pretty hot in 100 degree weather. And, uh, but they do need to be in an open space, 10, 12 feet out from trees. They love big trees. They love power lines. They perch on power lines. And uh, in most neighborhoods nowadays, you can walk down the street at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and you'll hear bluebirds sing. Most people don't know, don't know what they're hearing. It's not loud. It's not overbearing. 
but it's a little twiddly D. I used to whistle it, but I twiddly D song. It's pretty and serene. Uh, so, dog ear fencing. I make this box for about two bucks. So one board will do it. One more to make one and a, almost one and a half boxes. And you can pick and choose when you buy the boards. They sell them in single units in big box stores. But you sometimes you can see beautiful, well milled and uh, unwarped. So you choose and pick and choose and find a good board like this. It costs two dollars and forty five cents. Um, I've experimented over the years. This, this box is made from hardy plank. That's, that's a lifetime. And it makes a pretty nice box. You have to add some wood into it in order to, it's so thin it's hard to secure the parts with nails or screws. So you have to add some wood inside. And uh, this is a piece of soffit with the holes already in it, forms good ventilation. And we still uh, have spaces in the bottom that allows updraft. And uh, people often ask me, what, what, what is, what's a bluebird box? I say, well, it's a box painted blue, bird house painted blue. <laughs> they, they like these, they like most all colors. They especially like this box. <laughs> this one. Uh, I don't make many of these. <laughs> the, the bluebirds. This one will go back nest in this one. Sorry, we didn't see friends. Are there any other other questions about what I want to tell you about the bad box? Pretty box, isn't it? Made of cedar. Sell them everywhere for nine dollars and ninety-nine cents. Last forever. It is a death trap for bluebirds. See the size of it? About three by three square inches. Can't put a nest cup in it if you wanted to. The top it has a top opening, makes it hard to even clean out. And, and when it rains, where do you think the water goes back here? Siphons right in that slot. It's a good aeration, but it's also a channel for the water. I've seen a nest of bluebirds, babies, men. Bluebird babies in this box drowned after a big storm. The bluebirds don't know how large it is, and they'll build a nest. And the nest I saw had six babies. Sometimes the birds lay six eggs. And six babies in this box, they don't have room to develop. Or grow. Bad box. They do make this box in a bigger size, but you've got to be careful. They look just alike. Any, any other questions? All right. Do they just eat insects? Uh, they're primarily insect eaters, maybe 65%. In the wintertime, when the insects become scarce, they <coughs> survive by eating lots of berries, many kinds of berries. Dogwood berries. Jack Pitts used to harvest dogwood berries and keep them for wintertime feeding. Uh, service berries, lots of the hollies, especially native hollies, uh, they eat in the wintertime. And they love suet. If you've got a little peanut butter in the suet, they often come.
they can't open a sunflower seed right. like all birds. Even a little chickadee can open a sunflower seed. They put, she puts it under her foot and picks it open. A uh, red-bellied woodpecker can't open a sunflower seed without putting it in the crevice of a tree and pecking it open. Uh, cardinals can snap it open with their big beak. But, uh, but the cardinals, they love Yeah, they love the shell or the, uh, the shell sunflower seeds. That's one of the few things in the mixtures you buy that they will eat. There are mixtures with nuts and berries. They love nuts of all kinds. Uh, I make I make my own suet, and I add uh, shell sunflower seed, uh, chopped up peanuts. Sometimes any any uh, any uh, nut you you have that you can add to it, they like. Um, but way back. Um, after the bluebirds. Fledge the first nesting in the spring. Do you remove the nest or do you leave it in there? You remove the nest the minute the babies leave because they never go back in the box. The mother doesn't, and she never uses the same nest twice. She'll build a new nest on top of the old one. Then you've got a box full of messy bird nests. Between the nesting season, you know, you clean, you have one nest, um, and the next. I've got a nest in my front yard that's been incubating for about four days. Uh, and of course, 10, uh, 12 days, 12, 13 or so days, the babies will hatch. So um, the minute they leave the nest, clean it out start over. Uh, they use, as I mentioned, pine straw. Some people ask me if it's good to put pine straw around your nest. You put a bale of it around your nest, they won't use it. They get go down the street and across the street for every speck they put in the box. But do they wait like a month? Oh, uh, they, they, the baby's fledge and the parents know exactly where every baby is. They, they know where they are and they feed them for about two weeks. Then they become uh, knowledgeable about finding their own food. And about that time, she'll go nest again. And uh, other, other questions? How close to the house can you put a bluebird house? Uh, you can't have have them within sight of each other. Well, there's no magic distance. Well, how, how close to my house could oh, I put them? Oh, you can put them close to your house. They become people friendly. They are people friendly. That you can put them close to your house. 10 to 12 feet if, if that's it. I had some windows installed last year, and the birds continuously like spend hours pecking at them. <laughs> and nothing that's on the internet works. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a solution to that. Uh, perseverance. Uh, I have, I know people who have taken down that bluebird box because it comes severe sometimes. And uh, they're fighting their image. They, they think there's an intruder and they see their picture in your hubcap or in your side mirror on your car or especially big picture windows. And uh, I have a neighbor who built a million, a million and a half dollar <coughs> house and I wanted to give him a, a birdhouse for their, their uh, occupancy. <laughs> and they, the lady said, I don't want, don't want to move my bird box. I asked her why and she said, they mess up my windows. I don't want <laughs> it's it's pretty common, but not much you can do about it. You can put you can put uh, whirly gigs, uh, streamers, and stuff on your windows that might deter them. It's it's a tough problem. Can you? Aaron? How do you keep the snakes out? Uh, you don't. You learn how to grab them by the tail and <laughs> send them apart. 
as far as you can. Uh, predator guards work. Uh, this is a, a cheap predator guard. You you can buy stove pipes that uh, the bird stores that are good. Some of them are six inches. It, this is only four inches because that's uh, this is thin wall PVC pipe. Easy to work with, light, and uh, you slide it, you put a cap on it with a hole that'll go over a three quarter inch electrical conduit and uh, uh, hang it right, right under the box on the pole. Most of them. Average snake can't get, can't certainly get this. A big six foot snake can get around this. Uh, Jack Finch, in his experimentation of, uh, of uh, helping the bluebirds, had a wired in uh, compartment that he put snakes in and studied their activities. He, he uh, told me that he could see, he had pictures of this. The big snakes or any snakes make a foot out of the tail, like rigid foot that turn like this, and they got a foot to stand on, and they go straight up walls and get around lots of obstacles. If your pole is made out of wood, could you hammer nails into it? The nails wouldn't make any difference. Then give them something to clean with. Uh, yes. Um, my box that something a squirrel or something has chewed the hole, made the hole a lot bigger. Um, that's that's why Jack Finch devised this metal plaque. Yeah, right well, here. I had a Jack Finch box, and whatever it was, it chewed the metal bigger too. Well, so the squirrels can chew metal, and I've seen them do yeah. that. But it, so what do put I do another now? piece on it? <laughs> and, and our, our, uh, can I put a piece of wood if I yeah, don't have you a piece can put of metal? A, put a piece of wood. Uh, like this. Okay. Th thicker wood than this one. I'll tell you what this one is. Like this. It covers up. The, but I wanted uh, an inch and a half diameter hole. Is inch that the and a half one? diameter hole. It just extends. Uh, it is actually a good, good um, protection against some predators, big birds that can put the neck in and get a baby. I had that very same problem on two of our boxes, and I call, I had purchased one of the boxes from the credit union, which has a blue sheet in there about the Eastern Research Blueberry Group, Frank Newell, and he was kind enough, I called him, and he was kind enough to send some metal plates. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, Mr. Newell told me that the reason he puts the flange on here, because people do have so much trouble knowing, learning how to mount the box. And I said, well, why do you put this flange on there? He says, well, where did the bluebirds originally build? Trees. So he does that. I mean, uh, you can't, you can't <coughs> stick to all the information that, that you see. It's, you've got to play it by ear and use a little common sense. Um, you said that you could get the at a bird store, but they're expensive. What have you used? Okay. Hold on, another pole. <coughs> this, this one. Okay. Well, that, that, that I'll show you that. This is three quarter inch electrical conduit. It's a common thing you can find in the box store, in the hardware store. Comes in a ten foot section. It costs not more than four dollars for 10 feet you can cut with a little pipe cutter simple pipe cutter you can make two pieces out of it so it becomes a five foot section this is not quite tall enough five foot section works works great with two two hole c clamps three quarter inch fits around it and attaches to the box and then you buy a piece of rebar, 
four feet long, costs two dollars and ninety-eight cents. You buy buy this most uh, hardware stores and box stores. Four foot, half inch piece of rebar, and then you simply drive it into the ground about a foot, make it good and straight, and uh, then you can just slide the conduit right down over the pole. They sit on the ground. It's that simple. Yes. You have plans for your box somewhere? It's on the, on the internet. Uh, the um, We have a local Bluebird Society that I founded some eight or ten years ago. We still meet at Mordecai House at, uh, City Park. We met for many years in the chapel there. We now uh, are in a big renovated building next door on Cedar Street with a good classroom and facilities. And we have a website, bluebirdsofwake.com, dot org. Bluebirdsofwake.org. You'll find that plan on the. I may have some here. I'll see. You'll find that plan on that website. Also, a video how to make the box, the essential parts of the process. Piece of rebar, three quarter inch electrical conduit. You don't have to buy the 10 foot section. Lowe's and Home Depot both sell a five foot section. It costs almost as much as a 10 foot. <laughs> But if you're just buying one pole, that, that doesn't matter. So I have one nest that they've nested in right away and they keep going back. The other one they're not nesting in. They checked it out, they laid one nest one year and then they, they really don't like it. I think maybe because of the shrubs around it. it it's hard to say exactly what. <clears throat> I see that all the time. I've got one in my backyard. I've never seen a bird look in it. <laughs> and uh, you can sometimes move them in, in, in the same area that if next year they might use it. That might help. So it's too late to move it now for this spring? Uh, no. If it's not new, it's not too late to move it now. And uh, I'm just going to um, say, uh, we live next door to um, a plot of land that's owned by the city. Um, there's a big, beautiful tree over there. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, can a citizen just go set one up somewhere? On the uh, you, you might get away with it. I doubt it. <laughs> anybody would uh, protest. But you, the city is very lenient and helpful in, uh, if you call the recreation department. I, I get permission to put them on. City parks and greenways. Sometimes I collaborate with uh, Boy Scout troops and, and uh, other public or organizations. But uh, you have a hawk in your neighborhood, and you see it flying through the yard. Is that going to deter it from you? Uh, it might, but the, the uh, hawks don't. Unless they get pretty hungry, don't bother small birds as much as they do squirrels and other birds. But that's a problem. I had one sitting in my yard the other day, and I went out and threw sticks and rocks at it. It was so high, he just preened and looked at me and <laughs> sat there. And there was nothing you can do. And the, and the snake problem. A lady called me a couple of years ago. Said she had, she was crying. Said she had a snake, black snake in her box. You can see his tail sticking out. <laughs> and uh, she was crying and upset. And I said, Well, I sometimes make house calls. <laughs> I said, Well, where do you live? I'm, I'm coming to remove the snake. She said, I live in Brasstown, North Carolina. <laughs> That's where they have the possum drop every year. <laughs> near Merton. <laughs> So I said, well, I, I can't get there soon enough. So uh, I told her, grab a hold of the snake. 
put him up. So she did that. She came back and said, I got a hold of that snake's tail and slung him as far as I can send. <laughs> so, so that's about all you can do. Yes, sir. Uh, about 12 days ago, we had a nest, we had an a, a egg in the box. And then the cold weather set in, the cold nights. And then about two days later, there was a second egg laid in the box. And this is like 10, this is 10 or 12 days. In other words, it's been almost two weeks since these eggs have been in the box and we see no activity. Uh, does this mean that those eggs are abandoned? Uh, probably. Okay, would you suggest that they be disposed? Uh, be sure they're not warm. You can touch them and tell usually. On a hot day it's a little bit difficult, but you can tell. If they're cold for several weeks, throw them out. Clean out the box. Thank you. That violates the songbird law. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any experience um, with installing a camera into the box? The little uh, no, I haven't. They, they make uh, recorders now that are very simple as opposed to Mr. Van Heusen used in the video. Does anybody else here have you know, camcorders set up? I know a lot of people who, who do and are very successful. I, some of my programs with children and 4 H groups and I make kits for them put together like this, and it's fun to see them hammer, hammer the boxes together. I did an event for uh, Durant Park several years ago. There was the cutest little girl, about seven years old. Usually their mothers are there to have fathers to work in. Some of the mothers don't know to hammer from a, <laughs> from a, from a Garden hose, <laughs> but they, they're there to help the child. Sometimes the father would make it. This little girl was so proud of her box. She got it all together, and uh, after the meeting, I looked at it and chatted with her, and, and I said that the top's a little bit crooked. She says, when you get home, get your dad to straighten out the top. She did this, looked at the box and looked at me and said, Bluebirds won't care. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when she left the room with her mother, somebody heard her say, You reckon the boys will talk to me now? <laughs> In another case, uh, it was actually the 4 H Club sponsored by the Master Gardener program. We did 50 boxes one year and had that many kids hammering boxes together. And uh, I saw one of the, the parents of one of the little boys who made a box uh, several weeks later. It was already into the nesting season. And uh, I asked her if they'd put up his box yet. She said, no. I said, well, why not? The season's starting. She says, I can't. He sleeps with it every night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's, it's fun. Uh, I don't know what time it is, but I'll talk as long as anybody has a question. Uh, I got a clue. My daughter and my three great grandchildren just left. They got it. <laughs> it's good to have them here. It's a, she's a school teacher and she monitors my lectures. Gives me a lot of advice. <laughs> so where can we buy um, some of these boxes? Well, this is a Bailey box. You can buy it in Logan's and some of the bird stores. Cost you about thirty, forty dollars. It's worth it if you 
if you really want a Bluebird box. The credit union box costs over ten dollars because he sells them at cost. That's why the, the uh, credit union banks sell them, sells them for Mr. Newell so they can sell it at cost. In the stores, they would mark it up $40, $50, and he doesn't allow that. He, he wants them out at, at cost. Do you, you order them online? Is it? Yeah. Do you, do you Most of the credit union banks have that box on the floor. Uh, the, the one on Blue Ridge Road uh, has maybe 100 sometimes on the floor. Some of the smaller banks may not have them. And you don't have to be a member. You walk in off the street and buy the box. And uh, they also, he's also making a chickadee box now. Uh, not a chickadee, but a, 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 a nut hatch. The nut hatch is somewhat endangered. The, the experts tell us now. And they've encouraged bluebirds to convert some of the surplus boxes to nut hatch boxes by putting a one inch plaque over the hole. That prevents the bluebirds. They think that the bluebirds might be a problem with, with the disappearance, or the problem with their survival. Well, first year of that, a couple of years ago, I tried that put it on a box in my yard, my backyard, where I never had bluebirds. And I walked in the house and looked back and I saw a pair of bluebirds trying to get in the hole. <laughs> so I took the plaque off. <laughs> my theory is, if you've got extra boxes, you, if you've got 100 boxes, you've got a, not more than a 65% occupancy. So there are plenty of boxes left over for the chickadees, in my opinion. I did the same thing in a, in a Greenway Park near my house. Put one on one of the boxes on Banbury Park. Got in my car. Bluebirds are trying to get in the hole. <laughs> I took the plaque off and the bluebirds built a nest. There were empty boxes throughout the park. So that's, that's my theory. What do I know? <laughs> You just have to make them. You got to drill this. This uh, is a half inch. I mean, a one inch hole. This is an inch and a half. What bird uses the moss for a nest? Moss is a chickadee. They most always use nearly well, 100% moss, green, brown moss. You know what you've got. If you've got a house full of junk, you know, it's an English sparrow that's invaded. Uh, the house wren, the aggressive house wren, uses sticks. Carolina wren uses various leaves and grass to build a beautiful nest with a canopy. Uh, they'll build anywhere, in your garage or outhouse. Got a coat pocket hanging in an outhouse. I've seen a nest. Out <laughs> I've got a nest, don't tell the authorities, with a nest in a mason jar. It was laying on the side in my outhouse workshop. And the wrens built a nest in a mason jar. Do, they, do wrens come back to the nest a second year? Or once they've nested the nest, they are they finished with it? Uh, some birds, some of the birds, nest only once in the season. Yeah, but I mean in the next year. Yeah. They, will they come back? They probably will. I think they do. If you have a problem. And we used, early on we thought the bluebirds were monogamous. But uh, in recent years DNA studies have um, proved that the, the male fools around a lot. Therefore, <laughs> <laughs> so does the does he have more than one family in a, in a season? Some, uh, sometimes. Yeah. So he's feeding more than one? Uh, sometimes. That's been, been recorded. <laughs> All right. If, if, if there's no other questions. In case you don't know what the bluebird sounds like. There you go.
and and uh, this is the the uh, end of my program. I'll, I'll uh, let you listen to this bluebird. That, that doesn't sound too much like the bluebird, <laughs> but here, here's the real, uh, real song. Thank you. 